Hey everybody, it's Carissa and this is Bad at Keeping Secrets. Uh, this week I have MIT Professor of Philosophy, um, Kieran Satya here to talk about his new book, Life is Hard. Uh, and I think if anyone knows anything about me, I'm, I'm attempting really hard to try to make meaning and live a good life in this moment. And I think that this book has shares an understanding of my perceived understanding of reality right now, which I think is genuinely comforting. Um, and so I just want to, I'm really lucky to talk to you today to talk about loneliness, um, isolation, finding hope, um, kind of just digging into like the meaning of life, like what, what is the purpose in this sort of like collapse of meaning um, that I feel like is is happening all around. So thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So I, I wanted to start out, I guess, a little bit um, with a question I kind of am curious about with everybody I interview about kind of the exposure you had to philosophy as a youth or how you kind of um, your environment shaped who you are today and and the connection of that to this book. That's a great question. It depends on how far back we go. I could go back to, I think I started asking philosophical questions when I was very little, like at, you know, six or seven, asking questions like, why does anything exist at all? Like, what if everything just stopped existing? And I remember having a kind of moment of panic in the playground thinking, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem impossible. I don't know why it couldn't happen. And I, I really, at that point, didn't know what philosophy was. And it was much later that I, I kind of understood that there was a field in which people really try to take these questions seriously and don't just tell you the, the silly questions you ask when you're a kid. And that was actually through the, the horror sci-fi author H.P. Lovecraft. So I was a big H.P. Lovecraft fan as a teenager. He is a very problem. He's a problematic figure in, in terms of his racial views, but it, he was someone who was very interested in philosophy and had these sort of cosmic themes in his sci-fi stories. Like the, the basic trope is something that seems supernatural turns out to be alien science. So it's about the limits of human knowledge and the indifference of the cosmos. And I think that was the point in which I thought, what I'm really interested in here are these big philosophical questions about what it all means. Did, can I ask, and you don't have to answer this, but kind of what your parents, what the tradition, your family traditions uh, were in terms of philosophy and also in terms of, um, I think, at least for me, I'm in some ways subconsciously living out my parents' wishes in these weird uh -huh. ways that I don't, I never intended to, uh, but the fact like that I'm not a dentist, for example, uh -huh. <laughs> neither of them are dentists. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak to kind of that expand the exposure to like um, actual yeah. people in your life. I think they are very mystified by what I was doing. And I, I never, I still think they're a little bit mystified about what a philosophy professor does. It was not something that either of them really had a strong relationship to. So my dad is, grew up Hindu and my mother grew up Methodist and they, I went to church for a little bit. And then when my, my older brother said, I don't want to go to church anymore because I don't believe in God. I was three years younger, but I thought, okay, great. I'll opt out too. Cause I found it boring. And so I, I never really talked with my parents about big questions about meaning and my, they made a bit of an attempt when I got interested in philosophy to find out what it was, but it never really, it never really gelled. So my, my dad wanted me to be a doctor. He was a, a medical doctor and he still says I'm the wrong kind of doctor because I've, you know, I'm a <laughs> PhD. So uh, it somehow, I, I don't know if it was exactly re rebellion against my parents, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that really connected with them. It, it felt like a, a kind of venturing out on my own. And I suppose that was part of its attraction. I, I've been thinking a lot least lately about when raising my daughter, uh, if humans are naturally contrarian to an extent. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, just selfishly, because I want to hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there is, I, I don't know how old, your daughter is three, is that right? Or yeah. So I don't know, is, is she at the point of just asking why? And is that... Uh, I feel like there's something about Margaret and I, I get the impetus to always um, like marvel at one's child, but Margaret is very accepting of, I don't know. Uh huh. Um, That's very or, interesting. Uh, Although it's interesting that you have the, in, that you, you have the instinct to say, I don't know, rather than, I feel like uh, there's a certain impulse as a parent to try to come up with an answer, even when you don't really know, to try and kind of satisfy that, that 
that curiosity. I, I don't know if it's con contrarian. I do think there's a real willingness to question everything that gets a little bit worn out of you by school in, in a lot of cases. And, you know, sometimes I wouldn't say philosophers are always childish exactly, but there's often a kind of sense of mystery and questioning that has survived schooling and, and you know, remains there. And so I think sometimes that questioning leads people to be contrarian, because if you're questioning things, you don't take things for granted. And that that impulse probably probably persists. But yeah, I, I definitely remember, I think my kid wasn't super contrarian, but they they definitely had this relentless asking of why that many parents get uh, exhausted by. And yeah, that seemed that seemed to come from somewhere deep. I think that for me, it's the using the reverse psychology trick is uh -huh. so effective that yeah, it's making me that it that it's like making me question like uh, motivation in general, like across the board with humanity and uh, living organisms. But I wanted to kind of go back if it um, to something you said earlier about studying philosophy versus studying religion. Um, and I was wondering if maybe you could talk about the distinctions between the two disciplines and kind of where your interests, how you decided on philosophy. Yeah, so I, I mean, there is a philosophy of religion and a lot of philosophers are interested in, in religious views and, and they are their own philosophical kind of systems. But like a lot of contemporary philosophers, I'm not myself religious. And I think, I, I think a lot of philosophers have kind of feel the kind of spiritual needs that religion satisfies and are looking for other ways to satisfy them. And I think I'm self-conscious about that in the sense that I I'm feel very open about the fact that I want philosophy to answer questions about what is the meaning of life that religion might otherwise have answered. I think some contemporary philosophers are less, are a little bit more prone to suppress those questions, to sort of push away those kind of spiritual questions and, and cast doubt on whether they really make sense. But for me, a, a central role of philosophy is to think about ways in which we can continue to ask the questions religion asks about our place in the cosmos and what, what the meaning of life is and hold out hope for answers that don't depend on traditional religion. If like me, you know, you're not sort of part of a tradition like that anymore. Can I ask, um, I know that you've written about the meaning of life um, and it's not something that you can probably answer in, in the time we have allotted, but if you could kind of talk about like, if what how you rationalize existence at this moment again just for my enjoyment yeah <laughs> well i'm not sure i i the way i think about this question about the meaning of life is that what we when we ask about the meaning of life we want something like the kind of meaning we look for in a work of art where it it's sort of what is it all about a kind of account of what the work of art is doing and how it all fits together that tells us how to orient ourselves towards it and how to feel about it. And so I think when we ask, what's the meaning of life? We're asking something like, is there a way to describe what's happening with human life and its place in the universe at the moment that helps us make sense of it and tells us how to feel and ideally how to feel okay about it, how to reconcile ourselves to it. And I think with religious visions, often there's a kind of assurance that there is gonna be a way to reconcile ourselves to it. I think when you're not religious, the problem you face is that I think there's no assurance that we can be okay with the way things are going. I think that feeling that you just described of looking around and thinking, is the world going to be okay? Is humanity going to be okay? You have to face that without assurance when you don't have this sort of religious backing. But that doesn't mean there's no way it could turn out well. So my vision is something like this, that, that human history could go in a way that would lead us to be okay with it, to affirm it, to if we, you know, bend the arc of human history towards justice, we could look at human history and say, yeah, there were lots of terrible things, but I'm okay with this. But whether that happens really depends on us. We don't have any kind of divine fallback here. And so I think there is a way in which questions about the, the meaning of life, questions about how, what it all means, are at stake when we look at, at, say, climate change or injustice in the world around and think, are human beings going to make it through this okay? I think going back to, I mentioned this briefly when, when I introduced you, 
um, thinking about this book. I, so my mother-in-law is staying with us right now and she's a very, um, I don't know if she goes to two Bible studies a week. She's a reformed Presbyterian. And I think in some ways I'm very, I'm not envious. I, I would love to have that sort of, feel that sort of belonging um, and community. But at the same time, the, the doctrine is not reflective of my lived experience. And so I think that doing this, doing, reading this, um, I think for me is, has been really important in A, acknowledging that pain exists and not trying to fix it necessarily. And then yeah. B, also sort of, again, creating that moral framework. Um, and so when we talked, when you spoke a moment ago about justice, you have a, you have a section about justice. And I was wondering if maybe, uh, I know you said we were going to start with um, your story of chronic pain. But it's fine. We can start anywhere. Uh, can we talk about why the section, the, there's five sections in the book, right? Five or six. Okay. Yeah. It's in infirmity, loneliness, grief, failure, injustice, absurdity. And then it ends with hope, which it's not exactly one of the hardships of life, but uh, complicated. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll start with asking about the structure, how you, how you chose to divide it up in those, why those hardships um, at the forefront. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea was to sort of begin with the body and infirmity and pain and, and physical disability, and then just expand out. So to start thinking, well, there's also our connection with other people and our need for, for others and the, the loss that that entails. So we're led to think about loneliness and grief. And then there's a kind of wider role in society and the kind of projects we undertake and what we try to make of ourselves and the risk of failure. And then there's society as a whole and concern just for other people who we may not even know and they're not really part of our lives. So we're led to think about justice. And then the, the lens expands to, to what William James calls the whole residual cosmos, which is where we get these spiritual questions about the meaning of life. So there's a chapter on absurdity. And then, uh, yeah, it ends with hope, partly because I wanted to end somewhere positive, but partly also because I, I think the question of what to hope for and how to think about hope in light of all of the ways in which life is hard is very pressing. And I wanted to say something, if I could, useful about that. But yeah, so the, the structure is sort of start with the body and just get wider and wider and wider in, in focus. And, and part of what is at stake there is, I think, a vision of what living well is on which you, you matter and your pain matters, but it's not just about you. It's about your connections with other people and it's about your place in society and your connection with society. And that we shouldn't think about living well just about as, as a, a matter of you know, our own happiness as opposed to sort of really taking in the world as it is and responding to it as, as seriously and meaningfully as we can. So yeah, let's go back. Let's start with a little bit of your story about chronic pain and, and how, how that sort of affected your perception affected your perception of reality throughout your life yeah so i i i have chronic pelvic pain it was something that started when i was 27 and it took a long time as it does with many kind of chronic illnesses to get a well a diagnosis like, like the diagnosis is chronic pelvic pain which is basically just a name for the symptom and it's one of these things that's not really there's no reliable treatment there's various things people can can try and so there was a certain kind of i suppose if there was a an origin story of wanting to write a book about how to live well when life is hard. It was, it was something like a, a, this moment of, at a certain point, recognizing that I was going to be dealing with this forever. It wasn't going to go away. There wasn't going to be a magic cure. And I remember sitting at some point sort of, I can't remember where it was. I was just looking across the room at other people. It's just, people walking by strangers thinking, you don't know how good you have it. I was filled with this bitter sense of envy. You don't know how good it is to be pain-free. And then there was a beat and I thought, actually, I have no idea what's going on with those people any more than they have any idea what's going on with me. It may not be pain, but it, it could be loneliness. It could be grief. It could be all kinds of things. And I, I think that moment of realizing that when you're dealing with difficulty, often you oscillate between kind of just inward looking concern for yourself and those moments where you, it can be a source of compassion and connection with other people. And I suppose that was the, the moment, if I was gonna pick one moment in which I thought, okay, I should try to write about this. That was the, the experience of sort of connecting my own physical pain with a sense of kind of increased awareness of the ways in which other people are going through difficult things that we're mostly not even aware of. Uh, 
I, I think that's huge. I think there's so much in so much time that I assume that people are doing well because that's the information that I have access to. And right. I think like um, thinking about this. So my my daughter has cystic fibrosis, and when she was first diagnosed with that, uh, it was. I mean, there were so many. It, it was the first time in my life that someone very dear to me had been sort of had this chronic condition that there just wasn't anything to do about. It was just, right. that was just it. Not yeah. that we don't, I mean, she has treatments and things like that, but I think coming to terms with the reality of like in the past, like, oh, I would have a sore throat and I would take an antibiotic or like I had an appendix, uh, appendix rupture, I got a, had surgery. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea that like, actually we don't know and there's nothing we can do. It's just, we're going to, this is just something we have to live with. I think is, is something that I think um, a notion that kind of dawned on me later in life. It didn't, I was 36 when it happened, but um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about like right now, I think a theme in my life has been thinking about loneliness and its effect on us as a society also like in our bodies. And I, and since you had a chapter on connection and loneliness, I was wondering yeah. if maybe there were some talking points, uh, how philosophy can kind of help us acknowledge and recognize uh, these feelings and and how difficult they are to move through. Yeah, so I, I think one thing we can do in thinking about loneliness is is philosophically is recognize that there's there's a lot of, sort of public health concerns about loneliness and the health effects are really bad and that you know it's like uh, it's like smoking being lonely in terms of its kind of systemic effects on your body. And of course that matters, but really that's not that sort of side effects, what really matters in loneliness and what really is, is hard about it is this lack of connection. What we need is connection with other people and basically friendship, although, you know, family count too and, you know, romantic connections. And, and I think what philosophy does is, is help us to understand why friendship and human connection matter. And I suppose that the, the, the insight from philosophy that really helped me and that I connects with work in social science actually is that there's really a continuity between just the acknowledgement of other people and compassion, even for strangers, and the deep recognition and appreciation of someone's value that you have when you love them and you're in a, a kind of loving relationship. And they seem very different, but actually it's really the same thing that you're recognizing. It's just that someone else matters and that, you know, reciprocally that you matter too. And the, the evidence is that actually it, to a, a really surprising degree, even just small interactions of mutual acknowledgement can help us sort of push back against feelings of loneliness. So even just the encounter you have at the checkout or the encounter you have in the street with someone you exchange words with, that sense of just being part of human reality and being recognized by someone else, although it's not deep friendship, it, it's a recognition of the same value, your sort of value as a human being. So I, I think, insofar as there's advice there it's don't don't expect too quickly and don't rush too quickly to to reach for deep friendship start with just little moments of interaction and they will they will have a, a surprisingly deep impact on your sense of just being part of the social world and i think that's one reason why things like during the pandemic it's not just that we can't see our friends so easily just the ordinary daily life involves so much less contact with people i think that's really really hard to to deal with can you, there's something you said about being, uh, what, be, having good feelings from being recognized by other humans or, or seen. Can you talk a little bit about why, or theorize why that might be? And also what that, what that sort of, I mean, itch that scratches in us, I guess. So I, I do think it, it has to do with the sense that, uh, the, the basic sense of whether we matter without having to earn other people's affirmation. So I think that there's a sort of picture of friendship that actually I, I think we should push back against that goes back to ancient Greek philosophy and Aristotle where what friendship is about is having really, having virtues or being impressive in some way. And that's the thing you have to do to earn love. And I think one uh, kind of shift in modern philosophy that it, it sort of happens in the enlightenment is this idea that actually people's value doesn't depend. They have a kind of basic value that doesn't depend on having any particular merits or earning love. It's just the value you have as a human being. And that in fact, part of what happens when people love you is that they love you sort of irrespective of all the ways in which you're not really perfect. And so I think 
one thing you get even just from small moments of interaction is it, continuous with that is just the sense that you're worth interacting with, you count, you're, you're someone who deserves a certain kind of decent treatment. And yeah, like I said, that's not the same as deep loving friendship, but I think it answers to the same kind of demand to feel like you count, just that you are actually someone with value. I don't mean to be all like, I came to this shockingly, this conclusion shockingly late. I think it was maybe I could, I could probably pinpoint it to a, a um, some reading I was doing two years ago that I matter just because my exist just because I exist um and it did it wasn't something there was so many thinking about how these sort of deep sort of uh ideas of worth being contingent on production and service uh I think are very I mean they're very much embedded uh in ways that I just like I, I don't understand. And so I think that it is really important. I didn't realize that it came out of the enlightenment. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. It's been some time since then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's these sort of re residual aspects. Um, well, I think there around. are, I think you're right that there are just counter forces of, of assessing human worth in terms of like social productivity or kind of financial success or social success or competition with other people. So there are those counter forces too, at the same time as there's, a kind of vision of human beings on which it's like a basic vision of human equality that we're all we all matter just because we're human beings that i think it's easy to lose track of and you know i think one way in which lots of people have this difficulty as parents and as children of parents is negotiating the the ways in which parental approval can seem to be tied to various kinds of performance and excellence and then you know, you, you want to encourage your kids, but you want them to also feel like your love for them is just not dependent on them actually doing anything. It, it's really, it is unconditional. And I, you know, I, that that's something I think that people struggle with, yeah, as I said, as children, but also as parents, like really conveying that. A hundred percent. I think that it's, it's this constant uh, sort of negotiation and finding balance, but there's some something inside of me that longs to have it like everything clear cut and understandable and a, a solution, a right solution for every uh, situation, which is just, again, not not how how life works. Um, I was wondering maybe if we could go back to um, life is hard in the sense that um, there was, I wanted to talk a little bit of absurdity. Um, sure. And I don't have like a specific question, but life feels really, I guess, how would you define define absurdity and then uh, yeah, let's start there. Well, so the way I, I, I think about absurdity, there's, lot, there, there's sort of Kafka-esque absurdity, which we all deal with, where you're, you're like dealing with insane bureaucracies and life seems ludicrously complicated and irrational. There's also this sort of cosmic absurdity. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm really focusing on in that chapter of the book is a counterpoint to or frustration of the desire for, for meaning that, that we talked about earlier, the sense that um, we want meaning in life and what we want is for there to be some way in which we can tell the story of our lives and our place in human life as a whole, on which it sort of makes sense. And the anxiety of absurdity is, it really just doesn't. Like, it's just one damn thing after another. Human history just goes on in this direction or that direction. And ultimately, it is, it's meaningless. And I, I think that is, is one kind of anxiety about, about absurdity that we have. And I think it is, it's triggered when you see you know, people suffer who don't deserve to suffer, or you see people who are behaving terribly flourish and do well, and you think there's just no sense to this. It just doesn't, it doesn't have any coherent meaning. And that's where I, I, I think if there's going to be a meaning there, it's going to have to come from us shaping the world. It's not, it's not going to be given automatically, um, at least, you know, if like me, you're not religious, I think you have to, you have to accept that it's sort of, it's on our shoulders. So what can you we talked a little bit about this earlier but i just kind of was wondering if you could expand on what a good life looks like what a moral life how you how you sort of guide yourself without um sort of a religious doctrine um using philosophy to um be quote unquote a good person i feel like there's so many ways yeah. that um i was raised on this idea but then the there's no direct way to find the answers 
there's always a nebulous nature to it. It's true. So that, there's sort of a big question there about how we can have morality or moral knowledge without God. And I, I think the answer to that is, is in a way, I think the, the right philosophical answer to that is in a way unsatisfying, which is if someone says, look, I just don't think anything matters, or I just don't care about anyone other than myself. I don't think there's some secret philosophical argument that's going to persuade them out of it or show that they're incoherent. They're kind of like a skeptic who says, you know, I won't believe, I don't believe the external world is real. We're all living in a simulation and anything you try to, to say to them, to persuade them, they're going to, they're going to come up with an objection to. So I think we shouldn't sort of set ourselves the goal when we have a, a, a when we ask ourselves, you know, what would a moral life be? We shouldn't set ourselves the goal of persuading someone who just doesn't care about anyone else that they should care about other people. We should just think about how, when we look at the world around us, we just find ourselves, if we're basically decent people caring about injustice in the world around us and ask, okay, what can I do about it? And what should I do about it? And there, I think the, the an answer that I find really helpful comes from a, there's a political theorist, um, Iris Marion Young, who died of cancer a, a while ago, who, who talks about the, the way in which we're, we're often sort of embedded in structures of injustice despite ourselves. So, you know, an example I give in the book is, you know, I moved to Brookline, Massachusetts, affluent town, because of the good public schools. But of course, the fact that the good public schools are here is part of a whole system of basically de facto racial segregation in US schooling that I'm now, you know, profiting from by having my kid go to a good school. And the question is, okay, what do I do about that? And what she asks us to do is to sort of look at the structures we're involved in that are, that are in some way unjust, that, that we are in some way responsible for, and say, okay, what can I do to change this? And the change is always going to have to be collective. So it's always, it's, usually there's nothing I as an individual can really do. It's what I can do by joining some collective group. And I think what I find really enabling is to think of that not in terms of huge large scale changes but local groups like well, is there something at work or in your town or for me it was the fossil free mit student group at mit where a relatively small number of students a couple of hundred maybe were able to do something to change how this sort of juggernaut institution took climate change seriously so i think thinking about our responsibilities in terms of joining collectives that are local is a way both to do something practical. And also it's much less depressing. I mean, I think actually being part of a collective like that, it, it does, it, it's actually psychologically sort of sustaining to be part of something. It makes it, it makes, you know, tackling injustice, a sort of source of community rather than, you know, isolation. I, I mean, I don't think, I think we're always liable to feel like we're not doing enough. And I think, I don't think there's a solution to it. I think in, when, when the world is in a difficult place, everyone who's sensitive to that feels like, oh my God, I should be doing more. But that's true even if you're an activist who devotes your life to this. I think the sense that I should be doing more is just is just you yeah. know, a feature, not a bug, yeah. Uh, something you said about, I think it's so obvious to think about care, care what we care, listen to what we care about and then care about that, uh, uh, which reminded me of the Mary Oliver poem, Wild Geese. And I think there's a line where she says, uh like love what your body loves or something or something yeah, like yeah. that that i felt like it was really beautiful but also i think it taps into sort of these um maybe subconscious or things that maybe deep desires for for righteousness for justice yeah. for for goodness um to make the world a quote unquote better better place i think I think going back to, since we were almost out of time, I wanted to talk about two things. I wanted to A, ask you about your secret and B, okay. and talk about hope. Um, yeah. Which one would you like to go with first? Oh, let's do hope first and then I'll end with the secret. I mean, okay. yeah, so I mean, I really like what you just said, which is that I think you should we should just trust our sense of injustice and the anger that we feel about the world around us. I think that anger is really onto something and it's motivating and, Part of the, the vision of the book is that we shouldn't flee the difficult things in life. There's a kind of temptation to just shut ourselves off. But actually what's happening when we feel angry like that is that we're responding to the world. And I think you know, the short version of what I wanna say about hope is that I think hope by itself is 
sometimes good, sometimes bad. I think we, we should be ambivalent about it. Often what motivates us to actually do something is not really hope. It's something more like anger or kind of frustration with the world. I, the shift that for me is really empowering is to shift from asking this question, should I hope or not? Is hope good or bad? You know, climate change, should I be hopeful or should I despair? This kind of black and white question to thinking, well, no, actually the, the fruitful question is always, what should I hope for? What should my, where should I direct my hope? And it's not black and white. There's always something to hope for, even if it's just to figure out what I should hope for. There's always some way to direct hope fruitfully and asking, you know, hope or despair is just not a, a useful framework. So in the case of climate change, I think it, it's easy to feel despair, but on the other hand, there's, it's a problem that literally comes by degrees. So if we, if we can't keep global warming to 1.5 degrees, okay, well, let's aim for 1.6. If we can't do that, aim for 1.7. And then never lose track of the fact that just hoping, just feeling hope is not by itself enough. It, it, it has to sort of create the basis for action, even if we acknowledge that our own actions are, you know, just a drop in the bucket. A drop in the bucket is better than, is better than nothing. I definitely think that, um, I get overwhelmed by how much action and the scope of the project um, with right. regards to climate change and then and then and then shift my focus to something else. But I think like for, for me, when I think about using despair or hope um, in terms of a motivating factor, I for for me it's more effective um, to think about hope, or at least I want to live in a world where I feel hopeful and that's why I'm acting out of out of out of love, I guess, whatever that means, or a, a force of care and not a force of fear. And I yeah, don't know if yeah. it's necessarily appropriate to associate despair with fear and hope with um, benevolence of some sort. Uh, but I think like, for me, when I've been, uh, there was a time where I, I stopped taking my SSRI to try to switch onto another SSRI to have a child. And when there wasn't, when I wasn't excited about anything or hopeful about anything, it was a pretty debilitating state. Um, and yeah. so I think it, but it, I mean, it's hard to, to be hopeful when, when reality um, feels, feels oppressive. No, I, I mean, I, I think hope is a kind of necessary condition of, of action. I think by itself, it can be passive, but unless you have it, it's hard to act. And that's why I think this question, what to hope for is, is helpful because it, when it's hard to have it, I think saying, okay, well, it's, that's what's hard is, to, is that the thing you really want doesn't look realistic. So then you, if you ask yourself, well, what is realistic? What, what difference could I make? Or what, what could I hope for? That can be a question that, sudden, that sort of is enabling rather than fixating on, on a kind of ideal that may be out of reach. That, and I, you know, I think often when we think about the ideal life or the best life, we're just torturing ourselves with something that's not really achievable. And that's true as much when we look at society as it is when we look at ourselves. Like we've got to be, it, it's just useful to be realistic about what we can re really hope for. I think it's also this adjustment of expectations, um, which I feel like is this constant battle, uh, yeah. especially with having a child uh, and yeah. sort of reevaluating where, where you're at. And also I think in the long run has, I don't know. My jury is out on. I do think it's 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 been a lot of work to try to figure out what reasonable expectations should be in any given right. situation, um, and then adjusting um, my response accordingly. Uh, but thank you so much. I, I want to uh, so I want you tell because I I want to say also that you're the first person to want to share a secret in quite a oh, while. Really? Okay. Um, okay. Which I think is <laughs> I think might say something potentially um, about you uh and also about maybe you're good with directives uh well but... i definitely do as i'm told exactly if you tell me i have to have a secret i'm like okay i'm very obedient yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i was wondering um, so the impetus for sharing secrets was uh, it kind of uh is an interesting segue in this conversation in that it, i feel like vulnerability is this uh really connective force and i and i question like why we why we hide certain things um why we share certain things and uh withholding information and i think there's something at least for me that's cathartic about releasing something especially in this way there's a certain anonymity to like these these interviews and even though like because you can't 
like you conceptually know that maybe some somebody else is going to see it, but you don't actually. It's not happening. Yeah, right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to extend the invitation um, to you. I think that's really profound. I mean, I think about this about writing the book in general, that I talk about chronic pelvic pain in the book. And that's something I, I've talked about in person with like a handful of my closest friends and family and my wife. And But then I'm like writing it in a book. Well, that's fine. But somehow you're right. That even though it's public, it's also anonymous in a way. Anyway, so I, what I wanted to, this is, this is a secret. This is a, a exclusive that what, so while I was writing the book, I did six months of pelvic floor therapy, um, mm -hmm. which was uh, the, that with the somewhat tepid endorsement of my urologist who wasn't sure about it. And so pelvic floor therapy, as some listeners may know, uh, is not a super dignified procedure that it's a form of physical therapy. And there is only one way to gain physical access to a man's pelvic floor. So I, I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about that. So it's not going to be that it's not going to be TMI, please uh, put that out of your mind. But I will say what I what I remember very vividly was this amazing diagnostic conversation. So it was this lovely physical therapist who had this list of questions. And, you know, they started, you know, boring, like, do you have difficulty urinating? How often do you get up to go in a typical night? Uh, do you ever feel like your internal organs are falling out of your body through your anus? <laughs> and I was like, I, I, I loved this question. I was like, this is like physical therapist <laughs> mad libs. Like they're, you know, you ever feel like your lungs are ascending through your elbows or you have a sense of your eyeballs <laughs> exiting to your ears. And I assumed like every so often a patient must say, oh my God, that is exactly, exactly how I feel. feel. Like, I cannot believe you've put this into words. So I, I, I have to admit that, that that did not happen to me. And pelvic floor therapy, it was fine, but it didn't really help that much. So it, on the one hand, this is this is a somewhat sad story of of another failed attempt to to um, deal with my my chronic pain. On the other hand, for me, this is really emblematic of something I I try to sustain in the book and in my life in general, which is I feel like especially about one's own suffering, having some kind of sense of humor about it is really crucial to my survival. And so uh, even, even though this was not a, a, a medical procedure that worked, I, I, loved the, the, uh, I loved the anecdote I got out of it. So I wanted to, to share that. No, it, it creates such an intense visual uh, in your brain, uh, and I'm sure it's interesting. Like, if we were to sit down and like draw it out, what what this feeling actually looks like. I know I, it, it makes you think. Yeah, exactly. It would be. It sounds really horrific. Um, but I also so thank you, thank you so much for doing this with me. Again, the book is Life Is Hard. Um, it's out now. I also we didn't talk about um, midlife uh, at all. But I think that I'll just put links to your website. And you also have sure. a sub stack, uh, yes. which I don't know how, sorry, religiously <laughs> you write. <laughs> um, I should not use, have used that word in this context. <laughs> but um, but uh, I think that everybody should check it out if they're kind of thinking about these sort of large questions. Uh, I think your writing especially is, is, is very satiating in this sort of moment of trying to figure out these, these questions that feel upended in in the sort of uncertainty of our times so i really appreciate uh, your work and you putting yourself out there and also talking about pelvic floor exercise because <laughs> uh, i do think having these issues of chronic pain like not a lot of people talk about it or at least not a lot of people i've acknowledged maybe they're talking about it and i'm just not listening um which i'm open to that being a possibility uh but i think it is really important to express both of those as a connective a uh, connective force um, and understanding and relationship building. So thank you so much for this book. Thank anyway. you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. You too. Take care. Take care.